Okay, let's talk about the differences between ionic and molecular compounds. So we'll start with ionic compounds. Okay, so ionic compounds we can also call salts. Okay, so those are interchangeable. I know a lot of times people think salt is sodium chloride and that's it. Well, that's not it. You can call any ionic compound a salt. Um, and so those are kind of interchange. Now, when you have an ionic compound, that is something that is composed of cations and anions. And those cations and anions are bound together by what we call ionic bonds. And all an ionic bond really is, is an electrostatic attraction between the ions. And so it's kind of similar to the attraction between a magnet and a metal surface or between two magnets, okay? Um, and so that is really, it's just a pull, this force that's kind of causing those things to stick together, okay? Um, now, when you have an ionic compound, it actually is just really a cluster of all of these cations and anions. And so they arrange in what we would call a crystalline structure or they form a crystalline lattice, okay? Um, and so those structures, um, they're actually very strong because you're not limited to really this positively charged ion and this negatively charged ion interacting just with each other, okay? So not just one cation and one anion. It's actually a huge cluster of them. And so what happens is that you have so many of these interactions that it actually is a very strong structure, okay? And so that all of those interactions hold it together really tight, okay? At least compared to a covalent type interaction. Okay, between covalent compounds, I should say. Um, and so those structures tend to be very strong. Um, and so what that leads to is that these type of compounds tend to have like very high melting points, okay? Because it's hard to break those ions free of one another, okay? Now let's talk about a few more things. Um, when you have an ionic compound and you put it in water, it's going to dissociate into ions, okay? Now you have to be a little bit careful there um, because when you're dealing with ionic compounds, you have soluble ionic compounds and insoluble ones. And so um, all ionic compounds dissociate into ions when dissolved in water, but some, you know, only partially dissociated to ions, okay? And that would be the insoluble type, whereas soluble ones are gonna dissociate completely into ions. Um, and no matter how much of it dissociates, those ions that come off of that ionic compound, off of that crystal lattice breaking down, um, each individual ion gets surrounded by water molecules, okay? And that's what we talk, that's what we're talking about when we say something is dissolved, okay? The act of it being dissolved in some solvent is that solvent surrounding the individual molecules that you put in there, okay? So in this case, we dissolve it in water, so the water molecules surround those individual ions, okay? Um, <clears throat> and so that's really what's happening. Now, let's go back just uh, to the beginning and talk a little more about those basics of an ionic compound being composed of cations and anions. Um, now, it's really good to realize that the cations and anions, aren't, they don't really exist before the ionic compound forms, unless you're, I guess, maybe talking about the a reaction of ionic compounds. But in general, in the initial formation of that ionic compound, something has to happen to form them, okay? And so in reality, if you had these neutral elements and you put them together to form an ionic compound, what would need to happen is they 
the atoms of those elements would need to first form ions, okay? And so um, what happens is something's going to want to lose electrons and something's going to want to gain them, okay? And so if elements of, you know, elements containing atoms that want to lose electrons are near elements you know, atoms of an element that want to gain electrons. If those things are together, then what's going to happen is the one that wants to lose electrons is going to give electrons to the one that wants to gain them, okay? Because that's going to be a favorable situation for both, okay? Um, and the reason that these atoms want to gain or lose electrons is to get to a lower energy state. And so it energetically is favorable for them to trade them. Okay, or for, I shouldn't say trade, one of them to give the electrons to the other. Okay, and so in reality that happens and then the ionic bond forms. Okay, um, and so the atom that gives up electrons, whether it's one or two or three, whatever it is, forms a cation. Okay, a positively charged ion. And the one that takes on those electrons forms an anion, a negatively charged ion. And then those are attracted to each other because of their opposite charges, okay? Um, another good thing to realize is what forms these cations and anions typically. And metals are the types of elements that generally have excess electrons. And so elements that you find on kind of the left-hand side of the periodic table or below the stair-step line of semi-metals. Um, and so those elements generally have more electrons than they really need to be stable. And so they tend to form cations, whereas non-metals tend to have some extra electrons that actually they're willing to give up to because it will make them more stable. And so nonmetals at the upper right hand side of the periodic table are the things that tend to form those ion anions. Um, and so usually when you have an ionic compound, most often it contains at least one metal and one nonmetal. Okay. Now you can have ionic compounds that contain more elements than that, okay? It doesn't have to just be two elements, um, but typically it's always at least one of each, okay? At least one metal and one non-metal. Um, there are exceptions to that. Um, the ones that you would deal with are when you have ionic compounds involving the ammonium ion, and so NH4+. Plus. Um, and that's because the ammonium ion is actually a cation, even though it's made up of all non-metals, nitrogen and hydrogen. Um, so that it doesn't always have to be metal, non-metal, but most common cases that you deal with other than ammonium salts are metals and non-metals. Okay, let's look at covalent compounds or molecular. That's the same thing, okay? Um, both of those terms are used very common or very frequently. So whether someone calls it a molecular compound or a covalent compound, it is the same thing. Um, and I tend to interchange between those. It's just whatever comes to mind first. Um, and so you should be familiar with those terms. Um, now, when you have a covalent compound, that's always going to consist of two or more atoms, and those atoms are connected by covalent bonds, okay? Um, so you have to have covalent bonds in this. That's what's connecting them. So like when we have water molecules, um, H2O, the H's are covalently bonded to the oxygen, okay? Or if we have carbon dioxide, the, the carbon dioxide molecules have carbon atoms bonded to oxygen atoms, okay? Um, <clears throat> now, these are made up of molecules. So when you have a sample of a covalent compound, you don't have this huge lattice of ions like you do for ionic compounds. You actually have individual molecules 
Now, those individual molecules can kind of cluster together into a solid phase sample, um, or they can be very close together in a liquid phase, okay? Or they can be in the gas phase and really spread out from one another in clearly individual molecules. But regardless of if they're in the gas phase or the liquid phase or the solid phase, where then in the solid phase and liquid, they're really close together, um, they're still independent units of molecules, okay? Whereas those ionic compounds that form these huge clusters of ions, these lattice structures, um, that doesn't really have a definite independent unit Okay, so when we talk about ionic compounds, sometimes you'll hear the term formula unit instead of molecule, because there's technically no such thing as a molecule of an ionic compound. Um, now, the individual molecules, like I said, they can get close together in a particular sample, but those aren't forming covalent bonds bonds with other molecules. So within a molecule, you have these covalent bonds, but then when the molecules come close together, the molecules can interact weakly with other molecules. Now, when I say weakly, it's because I'm talking about things that are weaker than a covalent bond, okay? Um, but sometimes the interactions between those molecules can be very strong, like a hydrogen bond. Um, and sometimes they can be very weak, um, and that would be like dispersion type forces. Um, <clears throat> so those interactions are actually what kind of controls whether or not this substance would be in the solid phase or the liquid phase or the gas phase. If you have really strong interactions, they would be in the solid phase. If you have kind of intermediate, they would be in the liquid phase, or if it's you know, very weak and be in the gas phase. Although temperature also kind of plays a role in that um, because that gives energy to break those interactions. Um, whereas when you have ionic compounds, you have all of these interactions between these ions. And those, I said, as I said, are very strong, okay? And so that's why typically if you're dealing with ionic compounds, they're all solids. Okay, now you can heat it up a lot and eventually melt an ionic compound, but you would have to put a lot of energy in. Okay, um, and so that's a big difference between ionic and covalent compounds. Ionic compounds typically are just solids. Covalent compounds can be any phase, and that has to do with the great variation of how strong the interactions are between those molecules. Now, one other thing with covalent compounds, kind of comparing to ionic compounds, um, most of them retain their structure when they dissolve when they're dissolved in water. Okay, um, meaning they don't split up into ions typically. Okay, so that doesn't mean that they don't dissolve in water. So you can take a molecular compound and put it in water, and it could dissolve. Okay. Um, but what would happen in that dissolving is those individual molecules would stay intact and the water would surround the individual molecules instead of splitting it into ions and surrounding the ions, okay? And so that happens for the majority of molecular compounds. Now, you can have molecular compounds that are acidic or that are basic, and that's where it behaves a little bit like an ionic compound. So if it is actually an acid, um, then it will split at least partially into ions. And if it did that, then you would have ions in that solution and those individual ions would be surrounded by water. But for the most part, you have these molecules and they are surrounded by water, okay? Okay, now, Let's see, I've got one more thing here. Um, and just it's just a table that compares different properties of ionic and molecular compounds. And all of these are tied to um, 
kind of the basic structure of these things, how the individual pieces of these compounds are interacting, okay? Um, so remember, I said ionic compounds are crystalline solids, um, and kind of the key there is they are solids. Um, but like I said, you can heat it up a lot and eventually melt it into a liquid, um, but you wouldn't consider that a standard for an ionic compound. Um, so they have these solid structures, whereas molecular compounds have a great variation. They can be gases, liquids, and solids. There are a ton of molecular compounds under standard conditions that are gases. There are a ton of them that are liquids. There are a ton that are solids. But if we were under standard conditions, you know, just regular temperature and pressure, um, you would have all of your ionic compounds would be solids, okay? Um, and ionic compounds, because of the very strong interactions, tend to be very hard and brittle, meaning if you did kind of try to break it apart, it would just kind of crumble. Um, whereas molecular compounds, if they're in the solid phase, tend to be softer. Um, and so you can, you can kind of press on them more. You won't just shatter them into tiny pieces typically, um, or they won't be naturally these little granules like salts are. Um, now comparing melting points and boiling points between ionic and molecular compounds. Um, most often the melting points and boiling points of compact ionic compounds will be higher than molecular compounds, okay? Because your melting point and boiling point, if you can even get there, um, are very, very high for ionic compounds, okay? Um, for molecular compounds, there's a huge range. You have some molecular compounds that have low melting points, low boiling points, and some have high. But when I say high for molecular compounds, it tends to still be lower than that of an ionic compound. Um, densities tend to be much higher for ionic compounds, and that would just be because most ionic compounds are, or all ionic compounds under standard conditions are solids. Okay, um, whereas molecular compounds tend to have lower densities. Even when they're in the solid state, they tend to not pack as tightly as the ions in an ionic compound. Um, your ionic compounds, of course, tend to be strong electrolytes, so they tend to break up into ions, um, or at least they're weak electrolytes, if nothing else. Whereas molecular compounds can be weak electrolytes, non-electrolytes, um, or most of them are that you can have a few that are strong, and that would only be the strong acids um, that are molecular compounds. Um, and so since ionic compounds tend to be strong or weak electrolytes, they're definitely electrolytes, so they are more likely to conduct electricity, okay, whereas, or when they're in solution, whereas molecular compounds tend to not conduct electricity, or if they do, they, they generally aren't very good at it, okay? 